We all want robots in our lives. They can do lots of useful jobs for us in the future. But artificial intelligence is a very important part of this. Artificial intelligence is useful because when we put robots into everyday environments, and this is what I want to do, we want to take robots outside of industry and manufacturing and put them in our day-to-day -day lives. They may help in warehouses, they may help in hospitals, in your home, in your school. And it's really important that they're there and able to cope with the huge amount of dynamics and change that exist in the real world. Factory robots need a predictable environment so they can be scripted and done. Robots in everyday environments need autonomy. Autonomy is the ability to make decisions for themselves, the ability to decide what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. If we want robots in our everyday lives, they've got to have autonomy. Now, we're working on this directly. So what you can see up here, this blue kind of pillar box thing driving around, this is Bob. Bob is a robot in the School of Computer Science. He drives around the basement most days. So if you want to come and see Bob, by all means, pop in and, and, and say hello to him. He doesn't talk that much, but sometimes you'll have to push him around, which is quite fun. Um, this is state-of-the-art autonomy. Bob can decide how to drive around. Bob can avoid people, can avoid chairs. He can sense various objects and do a range of kind of useful, non-physical, non-manipulation tasks. So this is state-of-the-art. This is cutting-edge stuff. Despite the relatively poor standard of functionality of, of current robots, when I talk to my friends, when I talk to journalists, people in the media, after asking questions about artificial intelligence and robotics, the next question they almost always ask is, when will the machines take over? <laughs> Seriously. I, I mean, it's not really part of what I do, but I get this question a lot. And so when I was asked to talk on the topic of throwing caution to wind, uh, the wind, this is what jumped into my mind. And it's, it's curious why, what's part of our culture? Is it science fiction? Is it some kind of innate desire to see our own creations take over? And so I thought, well, what I wanted to do is explain you know, how this comes about and what we think about the future of robots taking over our world and wiping us out, perhaps. Now, this isn't just an idle conversation that people are having in the pub. Serious scientists are also talking about it. So at Oxford, there is the Future of Humanities Institute as part of the university. Their job is to look at existential threats to humanity. And they rate machine intelligence, artificial intelligence, as the number one threat that they're concerned about. They believe that AI and robotics is a serious existential threat. They think there are things that are more likely to wipe us out, but this is the first thing on the list that they can control. So they can't control meteor strikes, but they can wipe out, say, researchers in AI. It's not just them. Stephen Hawking's got on board. He's a pretty smart chap. Um, and he said, it's tempting to dismiss the notion of highly intelligent machines as mere science fiction, but this would be a mistake, and potentially our worst mistake in history. Success in creating AI, in AI would be the biggest event in human history, but it might be our last, OK? Smart guy making very serious pro proclamations about the damage AI and robotics can do. This all comes from a, a particular idea, OK? This is an idle speculation. There are people that really kind of believe in this idea, and most of it comes from the idea of something called the singularity, or more specifically, the technological singularity. And this is an idea that at some point in our future, machine intelligence, technology in general, will reach a point of such advanced capabilities, it will deliver a super intelligence, a hugely you know, awe-inspiring and unpredictable machine intelligence that is more than the sum of human intelligence. And it's a singularity because after that point, the people who believe in this say that we will not be able to predict the outcome of future societies after the singularity. So this is modeled on, uh, say, a gravitational singularity in physics, where when things enter a black hole or things enter a singularity, everything goes to infinity and you can't predict what's going to happen next. You can't model what's going to happen next. And they believe AI and robots, machine intelligence in general, will reach this point where it will change society so dramatically that we cannot predict what will happen after that point. In that notion, they say, well, you know, that's potentially what's going to happen is these machines are going to get so intelligent, they're going to look at us and go, oh, we don't need humans. Let's get rid of them. Or let's make them work for us or something like that. So the idea of this singularity kind of goes hand in hand with this idea of humans being wiped out by AI and robots. OK. So do I think this is a problem? We'll come to that. This is a graph which is kind of popularized in, in people who, who, who think about the singularity. Um, it's a graph that charts intelligence. So 
going upwards. On the y-axis, there is intelligence, okay? Intellect level, power. On the right, there is time. And here you can see from year zero, human intellect gradually plodding upwards. We've done all right with no, no special uh, cases. Then from 1950, the birth of AI, machine intelligence, the red line, shoots up. Exponential growth. It's a big idea about exponential growth in the singularity literature. Shoots up, and suddenly, at some point in the future, machine intelligence overtakes human intelligence, and we become transhuman, post-human, or machines wipe us out. Notice the time scale, 1950, 2000. The singularity is scheduled to hit us in 2045. That's 30 years from now. We're all going to be dead. Machines are going to kill us all, um, which is well within all our lifetimes. So, do I think this is an issue? No, absolutely not. And I'm going to spend the rest of my talk telling you why this is interesting science fiction, but technical, technically not a reality, I think. So, let's go back to this, these graphs. Let's go back and look at the underlying causes when people think about the singularity, what they use to talk about it. And what they talk about, when you look at this graph, this exponential growth of machine intelligence, they're basing this on the extrapolation of something called Moore's Law. Moore's Law is not a law. Moore's Law is a historical observation that says the power of computing, roughly the power of computing, how many calculations you can do with a certain size chip, has doubled every year. Think of it in another way. Intel has released every 18 months a processor that's twice as powerful as the one 18 months previously. And so this gives you this upward curve, this exponential growth. And you can see here, over time, the red dots are real bits of computing hardware. And we're extrapolating up to the year 2000. So we're, there we're kind of less than one inset brain. Year 2015, roughly, we get to one human brain, enough computation um, equivalent, somehow, of human brains. And by 2045, the point of the singularity, one computer will have enough computation to reproduce or to, to, to parallel all human brains on the planet, okay? So these red dots are real. They're real examples. Note the scale on the y-axis. This is calculations per second per $1,000. Okay, that's not just power of computing, that's accessibility of computing. So the $1,000 says you can buy off the shelf a computer with that much processing power. So when you think about this graph, we can see that there's real evidence for Moore's law. There's real evidence for the increase in computation power. Okay? This is, we can't argue with this. We could argue with the upwards extrapolation because a lot of ev evidence, a lot of experts believe that this doubling is not going to last forever. But there's one key fact that I want you to take away with today. And this is the thing, if you don't remember anything else I said, um, I just want you to remember this, okay? Calculations per second per $1,000, which is measured roughly by Moore's law, which gives you this upward curve, this exponential growth. Calculations per second per $1,000 and machine intelligence are not equal, okay? If you think about the first graph on the white background that's predicting the singularity, they're talking about machine intelligence, about this ability to have a machine that is smarter than humans, smarter than all humans, and one day becomes so great and so powerful and thoughtful it may enslave humanity or certainly change the way we live. That is not a logical consequence from calculations per second per $1,000, okay? That's the key idea. A lot of people have this notion that, well, if we can build bigger and faster computers, well, what we're going to get is smarter computers. We're going to get human intelligence in machine form, okay? That is not kind of a logical consequence of just having faster computers. And so what I'm going to do is kind of try and give you a kind of crash course in computing to explain why that is not the case. So let's imagine we're trying to create machine intelligence. And this is what people do, artificial intelligence researchers, programmers, every day. They create machine intelligence. What they're doing is building a piece of software to solve a problem. That's all machine intelligence is. And that's all artificial intelligence is in general, OK? So for an example, imagine the problem. You want your phone to recognize somebody's face in an image so it can focus on it when you're taking a picture. That's a classic machine intelligence problem, and one that we're now so familiar with, it doesn't even seem difficult. It just seems like something that our phones naturally do. But this is actually was an incredibly hard research problem that you know, probably hundreds of thousands of researchers looked at over the last 10 or 20 years. So you, you, you have a problem that you want to solve. And what you do. As a, as a programmer, 
or as an artificial intelligence researcher, is you sit down and you think of all the rules that would allow a machine to recognize a face or to solve the problem. And what you do is you take those rules and you just crush them down into a tiny little binary thing and you stick it in your computer. And that's what a computer program is. This is the process of programming. What you do is you write down the way that the program should work and the computer turns that into an application, into an app. When you launch an app on your phone, all you're doing is launching somebody else's rules that they've put on your phone. It's an algorithm, okay? It's a series of steps. You crush these down, you put them in your computer, then the input comes along. So you're gonna run your program on some input. If it's face recognition, the input would be an image. And then what you do when the input comes is you crank a handle, and then out pops the output, out pops the solution. It tells you whether there's a face in the image and where it is, okay? That is computation in a nutshell, roughly. There are abstractions, there are differences to this. You could do this in parallel. There's various ways you could do it. But that's the rough idea of how computation works, okay? So when we're creating machine intelligence, we're gonna do it like this. There are loads of examples around us every day. So another kind of classic artificial intelligence problem that now we just use without even thinking is route planning. So Google Maps, Apple Maps, getting us from A to B. In this case, the rules that are crushed down into the computer is the map itself, what roads connect to each other roads, preferences, such as how fast you can drive on a motorway, whether you prefer going the scenic route or some other route, and then some rules that tell you how to search. So what's the most efficient way of looking at all the different possibilities that you've got in your roadmap? The input is the start and the end, so where am I now? Where do I want to get to? And then, again, we just crank the handle. The rules look at all the, ma at the map and the preferences, and you get a route at the end, okay? This is machine intelligence. This is artificial intelligence. Or speech recognition. This is an interesting one. This is a field that was hugely challenging for 10, 20 years. People struggled greatly, and now it's on our phones. Now it's, you know, it's just a natural thing that we can work with. It doesn't always work very well, but it's very impressive given where this, this field was 10 years ago. And here, we use machine learning, typically. So this is a branch of artificial intelligence that uses algorithms that learn things for themselves. This is a great way of solving problems, but basically it's a very efficient way of finding rules. So what we do when we program is we put the rules in ourselves. When we use machine learning, we write a kind of set of higher level rules that can run on some training data, and that will find a new set of rules that we can crush into the machine. So in this case, what we do is we feed our rule-generating machine a whole bunch of mappings between speech signals, so recordings of people speaking, and text, so what would come out of the other end if we were to write it down. And then we can use algorithms using probability to learn mappings between this input and this output. So all we're doing, again, is just putting rules into our machine. We get some speech signal into our phone, we crank the handle, and out pops a machine translation. Out pops some text that tells us what I just said. It doesn't always work perfectly, but this is machine intelligence, okay? So now the question is, this is where we are now, and this is how the world of AI works. What's gonna happen when we accelerate machine intelligence, when we're gonna take this doubling of computation power every year? How is that gonna affect the way that we build and work with AI? Well, all it's gonna do is it just changes how fast we turn the handle, okay? It changes how fast these rules are applied. It doesn't change the overall setup doesn't change the, the idea that we have to take rules and kind of turn them into some kind of computer program. It doesn't change the nature of the input or the nature of the output. All it does is it solves problems quicker. This means we can solve bigger problems because we don't have to wait so long. It means we can solve more problems one after the other because each individual problem can be solved quicker. But crucially, it doesn't suddenly yield a conscious machine. It doesn't suddenly yield massive human intelligence that's gonna wipe us out. All it does is yield much faster processing. So think of it as your computers have got faster. Maybe you're opening a Word document. Maybe you're op opening iTunes. You buy a new computer, that process speeds up. Then, of course, the developers know your computer's faster, so they make their computer program more complicated. They put in a bigger set of rules, which then slows down the processing again. And that's all that's happening with machine intelligence. That's all that's happening with computing in general. So we're not gonna suddenly get massive superhuman intelligence just from an increase in processing speed. Instead, we're gonna get lots of computation everywhere. We already have computation everywhere on our phones, in our cars, it's part of our lives. This is just gonna continue 
And there will be AI, there will be machine intelligence in all these bits of devices and all these kind of connected devices on the internet, on your phone, as I said. All these things will have AI. And so machine intelligence will become everywhere. And it may change the way in which we live. But it won't suddenly become this great and dominating force in the world. It will be part of our lives the way that technology is part of our lives now. So that doesn't mean we can throw caution to the wind entirely. Just to reinforce that this doesn't equal a brain. We can't throw caution to the wind entirely. Autonomous systems will be part of our lives. And there are some difficult decisions and some interesting things we have to think about. Autonomous robots in warfare. A drone is just a computer program. Here the rules are about, is that a friend or a foe? Am I in range or not? And then the output, the solution is, do I kill it or not? It's just a computer program written by humans, but do we trust it to make life and death decisions? These are ethical debates that are going on right now. Another interesting problem, we've heard a little bit about this earlier, is um, computers working unsupervised, solving difficult problems. In this case, large connected devices buying and selling shares. In May 2010, there was something called the flash crash, where the Dow Jones lost a trillion dollars in the space of about 20 minutes. It lost and recovered it in 20 minutes. A large part of that was 27,000 contracts that were bought and sold in 14 seconds by high-frequency or algorithmic traders. These are computer bots. These are artificial intelligent agents that are buying and selling. They had a huge hand in destabilizing the market and causing this massive financial loss. So this is AI working in an unstructured environment and perhaps changing the way that we work and live financially. So we're not out of the woods just yet. But in terms of the big picture, in terms of this singularity and machine intelligence wiping us out, I think we're safe. I don't think we'll really have to bow to our new robot overlords just yet, so we can throw caution to the wind for just a bit longer. Thank you very much. <laughs>